Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, as always, and we'll continue now where we left off in the book, uh, The History of Romanism by John Dowling. We're speaking about uh, the, the period of time when there were three popes, three antichrists in the world, and in order to save face for this uh, most embarrassing of circumstances, the papacy called uh, a council, the emperor called a council, to settle the issue and uh, elect one single pope to replace these three so-called vicars of Christ. And in the process, they decided to demonstrate the church's power and its holy nature by uh, murdering, martyring John Huss, a born-again Bible-believing Christian who denounced the papacy as the Antichrist, and the fact that there were three such Antichrists all reigning at the same time is proof positive that the papacy is no institution of God, but it is a man-made institution, or rather, a Satan-made institution. And the whole world should have come to the proper conclusion about the papacy at this time. But the world wasn't ready to embrace the truth. Christ, Him alone, head of the church, the rock and the foundation of the church is Christ and Christ alone. He shares His throne with no one. And so, since the world was deluded by the papacy in belief that he was somehow the vicar of Christ, even to the degree that there were three of them reigning all at the same time, claiming the same title, vicar of Christ, and were not willing to accept the truth, Rome had her way with Huss, burned him at the stake. Now, we will begin, uh, I wish to begin at subsection 29 on page uh, 392, but I want to retreat a few paragraphs for continuity purposes this morning. Jerome and Huss together fell on the side of the Protestants. Jesus is the Christ, the papacy is the Antichrist. And in order to demonstrate this, the author says, one day, this is at the very top of page 329, if you're trying to find where I'm reading, one day Jerome and some of his friends drew a sketch of Christ's disciples on one side, following with, the, uh, following with naked feet their master, that's Jesus, mounted on an ass. While on the other side, they represented the Pope and his cardinals in great state on superb horses and proceeded, as usual, with drums and trumpets. I said proceeded, I meant preceded, as usual, with drums and trumpets. Now, for those uh, who are not familiar, as many aren't in our day, we've all had mental pictures of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the colt, the foal of an ass, and all of the people hailing him as Messiah. Hosanna! Hosanna! We've all read the, the story in the scripture. Now, Jerome and, and Huss obviously had wanted to demonstrate the juxtaposition between that event and a normal Roman Catholic procession where the Pope is brought into town so that people could see the true Christ and the counterfeit Christ on one piece of paper. On one side, a drawing of Jesus coming into Jerusalem, and then on the other side, the Pope being drawn in procession so that the whole world could see the difference. Again, he says, one day Jerome and some of his friends drew a sketch of Christ's disciples on one side, following with naked feet their master mounted on an ass. While on the other, they represented the Pope and the cardinals in great state, in other words, great uh, condition, wearing their best vestments, showing all their gaudy 
uh, aperture, appurtenances, you know, in, as they usually do in great procession, riding superb horses, and proceeded as usual with drums and trumpets. And I did it again. I said proceeded instead of preceded. Okay, those pictures were exposed in public. Okay, they were copied and shown in public so that the people could handle them. First looking on one side and seeing Jesus riding triumphantly into Jerusalem, and on the opposite side of that piece of paper, the Pope in procession. It was meant to be, you know, a, a picture paints a thousand words. Well, in this case, this picture paints innumerable words. The message that they were trying to portray from this juxtaposition of Christ on one side and the Pope on the other should alone have turned all of Europe against the papacy. Now, he says those pictures were exposed in public, and it's easy to conceive the effect that they ought to produce on an excitable and enthusiastic multitude. And then it gives us the instruction to see the engraving. They've included the engraving of this, this caricature so that we can see it with our own eyes. And the message is clear. There's Christ on one side and Antichrist on the other. Now, what a wonderful thing if one could produce a large woodcut in the form of a, co a coin about three inches in diameter. And one artistic-minded person might even use a wood-burning tool to inscribe these images, one on one side of the coin and one on the other side of the coin, a wooden coin, an inexpensive wooden coin about three inches in diameter, and duplicate this woodcut drawing on these coins and then make them available to as many as want them. If somebody has the ability to do this, this would be an amazing attempt in this our latter day to educate the world as to who is Christ and who is Antichrist. If anyone's interested in this project, let me know. You can email me, tom at seawaves.us. But that's what they did. They made this, this, uh, this drawing and posted it in public so that everyone could see, seeing Jesus riding triumphantly into Jerusalem on one side and the Pope leading procession on the other. Christ versus Antichrist. Now, such was Jerome of Prague whom his contemporaries have recognized as superior in intellectual, intellectual powers to John Huss. But the latter, John Huss, by his manner of living, his character and his piety, possessed so great an authority that Jerome always felt its ascendancy. John Huss was the master, and Jerome the disciple. And nothing does more honor to the, these two men than this deference this voluntary humiliation of genius at the feet of virtue. Now, subsection 29. The, the opposition of both Jerome and Huss to the Pope's Bull of Crusade against Ladislaus issued, as we have already seen on page 375, by John the Twenty Third in 1411 A.D., tended to increase the hatred of that pontiff to the Bohemian reformers. Huss did not content himself with attacking the bull, but Annam adventured with considerable severity against the Pope's pretended power of indulgences, of granting the full remission of sins to such as should engage in his pious work of butchering all who opposed his holiness in his views of ambition. Huss and Jerome condemned the papacy's pretended power to carte blanche forgive everyone their sins if they would engage and enroll and enlist and then fight this papal crusade against one of the other contending popes, or rather King Ladislaus, who had taken alliance with one of the competitors to the papal throne at this time. 
This idea that the Pope can forgive sins is the epitome of blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And this is the point that Jerome and Huss were trying to make. That on the fictitious promise of being able to forgive you all your sins, the popes led Europe into a war, a papal crusade, not for any defense of the so-called Christian faith, but to defend the Pope's prerogative as the sole vicar of Christ against his other two, these other two counterfeit popes. Everyone was given an opportunity to see all of these happenings so as to never more be deceived about what the papacy is. As I've said so many times, it was God's attempt, his merciful attempt, to extricate all of mankind from all papal pretensions. The papacy has no legitimate authority in this world, either over spiritual things or temporal things. And this is all the wranglings that had to take place to convince the world once and for all that the papacy is a counterfeit Christ, not to be obeyed, not to be worshipped, not to be honored, but condemned as Antichrist. But the world just wouldn't have it. Now, after referring to the sentiments of Augustine and Gregory, Huss says, quote, When then those two great saints have not dared to promise remissions of sin, even to those who have done penance, and what countenance can Pope John in his bull promise the most entire remission of sins and the recompense of eternal salvation to his accomplices? All right, if the great saints of the Roman Catholic Church never even dared to forgive one and, uh, any man his sins, reserving that to Christ alone, then how can the Pope who supposedly stands upon all the wisdom of the church, particularly Augustine and Gregory, pretends that he has the power to remit sins, and especially to those who are ready to go to war to uphold his temporal power, a purely worldly thing. He says, when then those two great saints, Augustine and Gregory, have not dared to promise remission of sins, even to those who have done penance, with what countenance, with what arrogancy, can the Pope John the Twenty Third, in his bull promise the most entire remission of sins and the recompense of eternal salvation to his accomplices in the crusade? All right? If notwithstanding the example of Christ, the Pope strives for temporal dominion, dominion or domination, it is evident that he sins in that, as do those who aid him in that object. Okay? The message is clear. Christ didn't seek any temporal dominion. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He was not a temporal ruler. But the Pope, who claims to be his successor or his vicar, claims nothing but temporal dominion. Okay? To be king of kings. And this is obviously sinful. This is not the, 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 the uh, example that Christ set. But the Pope focuses all of its efforts on, main, on achieving and maintaining the Pope's universal temporal power as King of Kings. Now, how then could the indulgence granted for a criminal act be of any value? Unquote. Since it would be criminal to engage in a crusade to secure and advance and maintain the Pope's temporal power, which we've already proven to be sinful, how could the Pope's indulgences granted to participate 
in these crusades be of any value? The answer is obvious. The Pope is not the vicar of Christ. He's not the voice of God on the earth. He is the Antichrist. He doesn't seek to redeem the world. He seeks to conquer the world by force. He's not the spiritual leader of anyone, but he seeks to be the temporal ruler of everyone. And anyone engaged in this criminal act to elevate the Pope to a global temporal uh, uh, sovereign has participated in a criminal act. And would God grant indulgence to someone engaged in such criminal activity? The answer is obvious. The whole thing is a devilish pretense. Now, for those, again, who look to the distant future for an antichrist, they've been deceived. They've been deceived, and they've been deceived by the Protestant churches in this country, who have been deceived by the Roman Catholic Church, that insists, and has ever insisted, that the papacy is not the Antichrist, despite <coughs> the written word of God and the written word of history and the written word of common sense. Okay? The whole world is deceived. Do you expect one single individual coming just before the second the coming of Jesus Christ to, to deceive the world so completely as has the papacy? How is one man, just before Christ's return, this so-called future Antichrist, how is he going to so thoroughly deceive the whole world as has the papacy for 2,000 years? You see, futurism falls flat on its face in light of Scripture and history and prophecy. And it's these scriptures and these prophecies that the Protestant pastors of this world have confused and confounded us. And it's this history that they've hidden from us. A triple crime. They are not to be trusted. It's time for us to know the truth. Now the author continues, the Pope cannot throw without any special revelation... <clears throat> Excuse me. The Pope cannot know without an especial revelation if he is predestined to salvation. Okay? He cannot, therefore, give such indulgence to himself. It is not besides contrary to the faith that many popes who have granted ample indulgences, forgiven multitudes of sins, are in fact damned. No one even disputes that. There were many, well, here I'm beginning to sound like some of my opposition. Every pope is a, a human manifestation of Satan himself. There is no virtue whatsoever in any pope. The papacy altogether, and the papacy as a succession of individual popes are equally and likewise the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. The pope has no power to grant indulgences for the forgiveness of sins if you participate in one of his papal crusades to elevate himself to a global sovereign king. He can't grant an indulgence to himself, is what the author is trying to say. Then how can he offer indulgences to anyone else? How can a damned institution, an institution that is damned in the scriptures and in history and in prophecy, forgive anyone of their sins? The author continues, he says, Of what value, therefore, are their indulgences, their indulgences, their forgivenesses of sin, in the sight of God? No saint in Scripture has granted indulgences for the absolution of the penalty of the trespass during a certain number of years or days. 
Our doctors have never dared to name any of the fathers as having instituted or published indulgences because, in fact, they are ignorant of their origin. It was never before known in the Christian world. Indulgences? From a man? Only God can forgive sins. All right? And if these indulgences which are represented as so salutary to mankind, have slumbered, in other words, never been known prior to now, as it were, for the space of a thousand years or more, the reason most probably is that covetousness had not at that period, as at present, reached its highest point. So what's he saying? Indulgences were just a matter of covetousness by the papacy. It was an empty promise granted to all of Europe to have their sins forgiven because the Pope wanted to rule the whole world. Covetousness. The papacy is the man of covetousness. He, the papacy violates institutionally each and every commandment in the Scripture. Romans chapter 20, or uh, rather, uh, uh, Genesis chapter 20. Just read it for yourself, the Ten Commandments. The institution of the papacy systematically violates and violates perfectly all ten of those commandments. Now, that's the mark of Antichrist, isn't it? The Lord said, Thou shalt not covet. You know, we shall not covet our, 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 our neighbor's manservant, his maidservant, his ox or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. But the Pope covets everything. He says in his heart, The earth is mine and the fullness thereof. And the Scripture gives us even further admonition. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world, as has the Pope? What shall it profit a man, in this case we would say the man of sin, if he should gain the whole world, as he has in our day, and lose his own soul? In other words, he's damned, isn't he? So what good are his indulgences? He's the most covetous of all covetousness. He not only wants your property and my property and everyone's property, he not only wants your power, my power, and everyone else's power, he wants to rule the kings of the earth as his vassals, he wishes to make every man, woman, and child on the planet a slave. He wishes to own heaven, earth, and the underworld and hold the keys to all three. And if that's not coveting the whole world, I don't know what it is, but the Bible plainly says the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. He covets God's throne. He covets God's throne and his footstool. He is the man of covetousness. No one has ever rivaled the papacy, even close for covetousness. And that's the message these reformers were trying to advance to the whole deceived Christian world. This is the message God, the merciful God of glory, was trying to advance to all of his children enslaved by the papacy at this time. And he used Huss and Jerome to do it. And it's important that we understand their history. We'll continue right after the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio.
Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, Nations have fought for it. It has been traded. It has been borrowed. It has been purchased. It has been stolen. There's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Okay, welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support this program and keep it on the air, please support First Amendment Radio. Now back to the book. Huss is going to demonstrate the absurdity of this so-called power to pardon sins, the power of indulgences of the Pope. She says, in order to show the absurdity of the pretended power to pardon the sins of those who should contribute money towards the Pope's crusade, Huss uses the following illustration. Quote, Of two men, says he, one has been the offender all of his life. Okay? One man has been a sinner all of his life. And provided he pays a sum of money, he can obtain, by means of a very slight contrition, remission of his sins and of their consequent penalty. The other is the man of worth, a very rich man, who has never committed but venial sins. Yet, if he gives nothing, he shall have no pardon. Now, according to the bull... If those two men should happen to die, the former, the criminal, will go straight to heaven, escaping the pains of purgatory. And the second, the just man, will have to undergo them. He'll have to go through purgatory. Now, were such indulgences really available in heaven? We ought to pray to God that war might be waged against the Pope in order that he might throw open all the treasures of the church, unquote. Huss is suggesting that if the Pope can offer plenary indulgence 
forgiveness of all your sins, no matter how heinous they are, then maybe we're ready to wage the wrong crusade. Instead of going to war against Ladislaus, maybe we ought to go to war against the papacy and break down the walls of the papacy and take the papacy prisoner and force him to open the pearly gates of heaven for all of us. Now, how absurd would that be? You see Huss's point? If you're going to continue to believe that the papacy has the power to open the pearly gates of heaven, that your, all of your sins be forgiven, carte blanche, without the mercy and the grace of Almighty God through the blood shed blood of Jesus Christ, that the Pope holds the keys to heaven, to, uh, heaven, then let's quit wasting time killing one another over these three pretended popes, and let's just bombard the Vatican and take those keys away from them and let us all loose. We can all go to heaven free of charge. And we, like the papacy, can continue in sin. Because we have the indulgence of the Pope. We've forced him to grant the indulgence to everyone. Now, this example ought to have opened the eyes of every blind, deaf, and dumb person in all of Europe. It should have opened the eyes of the whole world. You see the mission of mercy that Huss is on? Huss is g g genuinely the instrument of God on the earth to show the absurdity of the papacy. God is making an open mockery of the papacy, a humiliating mockery of the papacy. All of Europe should have been liberated from papal control at this time. The whole Western world should have simply walked away from all three of these pretenders. Liberated in Christ. Seeking forgiveness of sin from Him through His precious shed blood. A free gift. All of Europe should have been liberated by John Huss alone. And it was God who animated John Huss. But instead, John Huss became a martyr. His life was treacherously taken from him by the popes at the Council of Constance. The author continues, he says, In reading these extracts from the writings of Huss, it is impossible not to think of the still more severe and pointed rebukes of Luther Martin Luther, a hundred years later, of this blasphemous pretense of pardoning sin for money, excited by the conduct of the infamous Tetzel, the indulgence peddler of Pope Leo X. No, the example of Huss wasn't enough. It still took the martyrdom of John Huss, and it took the persecution of Martin Luther, and for a time, and only for 500 years or less, were Protestants liberated from the power of Rome. But now we are just as much enslaved 500 years later as those who were enslaved under the time of Huss. The world is only going to get worse and worse and worse. Sin is only going to be more and more and more rampant. Intolerance is only going to be more and more and more pervasive. Government is going to become more and more and more corrupt. Tyranny is going to reign without opposition in this country until the world finally gets the message of John Huss and Martin Luther. So do you see the value of reading the history of John Huss and Martin Luther and all the true saints of God throughout history and how they were persecuted by the papacy? We could be liberated in a day if we could just understand their message and accept it. But we're too busy ecumenic, ecum, ecumeniacally reuniting with that Roman Catholic Church. 
in the false hope of a unity in Christ. You can't serve two masters. You ecumenical evangelical bellies, you Protestants in name only, are leading the whole world astray. You're undoing the Protestant Reformation. You're not the instrument of God on this world like Huss was. You're the instrument of destruction. Spiritual and temporal destruction of God's people. The result of your, ex- your, your, your ecumenical movement to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church is going to lead the saints to the gallows and the truth right out of this world with them. Your garments will be soaked with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus just like the popes are. You think that's pretty tough talk? It's based in divine truth. It's based in historical truth. And it's based in prophetic truth. The Bible speaks of this apostasy. And how the whole world wonders after the beast. And you know who's leading the whole world to wonder after the beast? Those pastors who once called themselves Protestants. And how are you leading them all to the beast? You preach that the papacy is not the Antichrist, but that the Antichrist is one single individual that comes just before Christ's return. He'll sign a peace treaty with the Jews for seven years, and in the midst of that seven-year period of time, he'll break the treaty. When that prophecy refers to none other than Jesus Christ himself, who made a covenant with many for one week, Three and a half years after his baptism, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by becoming the sacrifice himself, thereby causing all other sacrifices and oblations to cease. But for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation. You've been lied to, and you've perpetrated the lies. You've perpetuated the lies. You've made lies orthodoxy. You can't tell the difference between Jesus Christ and Antichrist. And you use your ignorance, your abject spiritual and scriptural and historical ignorance, to promote yourself to the highest place in the church, behind the pulpit. There's a judgment day coming for you. And I believe it's already begun. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. The Roman Catholic Church has been exposed again by God for its debauchery, its murders, its crusades, its papal assassination, its global pedophile priest pandemic, its Vatican bank scandals. And you know what's going to follow? The same debauchery in the once Protestant churches. You followed the lead of your Romish, whorish mother, and now you're going to partake of her plagues. You've participated in her sins, and you will also be subject to her plagues. And my advice to all my listeners, if you're going to an established church that is not telling you who the Antichrist is, and is not preaching against these pretended Protestant pastors who are teaching futurism from cradle to grave all over this world, if you're going to a church that does not admit that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy, then you have no nothing else to do but get out of that church. They've become Catholic in their teaching. They've taken on the very image of their whorish, Romish mother. Only a Roman Catholic would deny that the papacy is the Antichrist. That makes it a Catholic church. I don't care if the sign out front says Baptist, Presbyterian, Episcopal, Lutheran, 
I don't care if it says Protestant. If they don't tell you who the Antichrist is, by innumerable proofs, as I'm doing, they're a Catholic church. They've taken on the very image of their mother, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. You'd be better to stay at home with a King James Bible in your lap and a prayer on your lips and a tear in your eye, even if you have to do it alone, than to go to one of these corrupt churches. God's people once knew the truth. They shouted it from the rooftops and they were burned at the stake for doing so. We'd be better to follow their example than follow the hordes, the lemming hordes that are jumping over the cliff into Roman Catholicism. Subsection 30. This noble reply of Huss to the bulls of Pope John XXIII, while it increased his favor and influence with the people, drew on him the hostility of the papal court and the state court. Remember, the state and the, and the church are united. It says the king was then at war with Ladislaus. In other words, he was responding to the bull, Pope John the Twenty-Third. He was engaged in a crusade against Ladislaus. All of Europe was on the precipice of war. And it says his favor, like that of the greater part of princes, was subordinate to his political interests. Okay? So the king was engaged in this crusade to protect his kingly status with the Pope, right? He says he therefore accepted the bulls and withdrew for a time his support for John Huss. Prague was then divided between two powerful parties. All who had favors to expect from the king or the people declared themselves in support of the bulls. And to this period must be assigned the rupture between Huss and Stephen Palance, an influential member of the clergy. Palance had been his friend and disciple, but being as anxious for the advancement of his fortune as Huss was for the progress of truth, he preached in favor of the bulls and of the indulgences, and you know as well as I do, the Crusades, right? Now these reverses, however, did not shake the resolution of Huss. He carried, or rather he caused a placard, a sign, to be put upon the doors of the churches and the monasteries of Prague, inviting the public and particularly all doctors, priests, monks, and scholars to come forward and to discuss the following thesis. Quote, whether according to the law of Jesus Christ, Christian, uh, Christians could, with a safe conscience, approve of the crusade ordered by Pope against Ladislaus and his, and his followers, and whether such a crusade could turn to the glory of God, to the safety of the Christian population, and to the welfare of the kingdom of Bohemia, unquote. So there's the question that Huss posed to all of Europe. Come and debate with me. Let's reason together one another. Whether according to the law of Jesus Christ, that is the Scriptures, whether it is possible according to the Bible that Christians could with a safe conscience approve of this papal crusade ordered by the Pope against Ladislaus and his followers, and also whether such a crusade could turn to the glory of God, to the safety of the Christian populations, and to the welfare of the kingdom of Bohemia. Let's get together and talk about it. Anybody else think John Huss is signing his own death warrant to have this public debate? He says, On the appointed day, the concourse was prodigious, and the rector, in alarm, endeavored, though in vain, to dissolve the assembly. They didn't want this debate to take place. 
A doctor of the canon law stood up and delivered a defense of the Pope and his bulls. Then, falling upon John Huss, he said, quote, You are a priest. You are subordinate to the Pope, who is your spiritual master. It is only filthy birds that defile their own nests. And Ham was cursed for having uncovered his father's shame, unquote. Do you understand what this priest was accusing John Huss? That you're pooping in your own nest. You're a paid vassal of the Pope. You wear the, 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 the vestments of a priest because the Pope put them on you. You live a lush life just like the rest of us priests. And yet you poop in your own nest. You bite the hand that feeds you. Right? And it was also Ham who was cursed for having uncovered his father's shame. You're a ham, John Huss. You've thrown open the curtains of your father's tent and shown his nakedness to the world. You are as cursed as Ham for having done so. You see the treachery of the Roman Catholic priesthood to compare John Huss to Ham? At these words, the people murmured and were in great, com uh, great commotion. Already were stones beginning to fly when John Huss interfered and calmed the storm. After him, the impetuous Jerome of Prague addressed the multitude and terminated a vehement harangue with these words, quote, Let those who are our friends unite with us. Huss and I are going to the palace, and we will let the vanity of those indulgences be seen, unquote. In other words, we're going to take this debate. Though you've forbidden it to take place in public, we're going to do it in the king's court. We're going to leave all you ignoramuses alone, and we're taking the argument against this crusade, against the pretended power of the Pope to grant indulgences and forgivenesses of sin for anyone who will pay for and engage in this bloody crusade against Ladislaus in order to, uh, to uh, uh, increase his temporal power for no other reason. We're going to take our arguments to the king. Since you won't tolerate this debate to be taking place openly in public, we're going to take it directly to the king, the one who has the power to put an end to this crusade. Now, Jerome was, however, persuaded not to go to the palace, but the feelings of the excited multitude could not be calmed. On the following Sunday, an event occurred which raised this excitement to the almost ungovernable pitch. A report was in circulation that three men had been thrown into prison by the magistrates for having harangued against the Pope and indulgences. Okay? So Jerome and Huss's arguments were catching on. People were beginning to mimic John Huss and Jerome bringing accusation against the Pope for his worldliness, for his conquests, for his phony indulgences, and they were thrown in prison. Okay, It wouldn't have been as easy to throw Huss and Jerome. They were too popular. But they took two others who were less, well, venerable and threw them in prison for the same accusation. Now the students rose... Arms were taken up, and Huss, followed by the people and the scholars, proceeded to the townhouse and demanded that the prisoners' lives should be spared. <clears throat> 2,000 men were in arms in the square. Can you imagine this? They took two men into, into, into custody <laughs> for sharing the same so-called heresies as John Huss and Jerome, and it took 2,000 men in arms to secure those prisoners. 
Quote, Return peacefully to your homes, cried John Huss to them. The prisoners are pardoned. Unquote. The crowd shouted their applause and withdrew, but a short time after, blood was seen to flow in abundance from the prison. The senators had determined on the most dangerous course, that of endeavoring to inspire terror after having exhibited, the, exhibited it themselves. An executioner had been introduced and had beheaded the prisoners, and it was their blood which had escaped. At this sight, a furious tumult arose. The doors of the prison were burst open, the bodies taken off and transported in linen shrouds under the vault of the chapel of Bethlehem. There were there, inter they, there they were interred with great honors, the scholars singing in chorus over the tomb. Quote, they are saints who have given up their body for the gospel of God. Unquote. Do you realize the same should be said of John Huss and Jerome? They were saints who had given up their bodies for the gospel of God. They were killed for simply saying Huss and Jerome are correct. The Pope has no power to forgive sins. Not for money or for anything else. Not even if you fight in his crusades. The Pope has no power to grant sins, uh, forgive sins and to grant indulgences. John is getting, John Huss is seeing with his own eyes his own demise. How they treated these two prisoners is precisely what Rome has in store for John Huss. It says, Indignation gradually pervaded the whole of Bohemia, and John Huss, in his violent invectives against the Pope, used but little moderation. I've run out of time at the most misopportune time. John Huss finally gets it. John Huss finally gets all of it. And John Huss is going to do the unthinkable at this time. He's going to tell for everybody's understanding precisely what the papacy is. John Huss fully now realizes he is the man of sin. And he's going to tell us about it on the Monday's broadcast. Don't miss it. It's precious Protestant history. I'll see you then. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening.
Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.